Long before the first humans arrived, large grazing animals roamed the continent of Europe. Species such as aurochs, wild horse, European bison and deer all had their own unique impact on the landscape. Through this interaction, they played a critical role in the lives of myriad other wildlife species. Over time, agricultural land use grew and grazing was merely seen as an agricultural practice. As intensive livestock grazing increased, so large wild grazers disappeared from the land. But, as we learn today, the landscape still remembers. Today, Europe is facing major environmental challenges. Climate change, biodiversity loss, soil degradation, and an increasing risk of wildfire call for urgent action. At the request of the European Commission, Rewilding Europe and its partners in the Graze Life Consortium looked at how grazing could help to address these challenges. Over the past three years, a team of experts conducted case studies, literature reviews and numerous interviews with stakeholders. These helped the team generate recommendations for both policymakers and practitioners and offer a hopeful perspective for the future but changes are urgently needed. So the extensive Grace Life study resulted in 45 practical recommendations for policymakers and practitioners. Some of the most important ones relate to Europe's common agricultural policy, the GAP, which is the single most important factor influencing grazing and herbivore management in Europe. But unfortunately, at this moment, the GAP mainly favors intensive land use, leading to biodiversity loss, social and health costs, serious environmental impact. It all starts with the realization that large grazers in low, natural numbers can help our ecosystems thrive. This extensive grazing provides many public goods and is beneficial for both nature and people. It could even help to realize 13 out of the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Extensive grazing supports rural economies especially in areas with production difficulties. It helps to restore vegetation mosaics with high levels of biodiversity, contributing to attractive and healthy landscapes, clean waters and soils, and enhancing carbon storage in soil and vegetation. And by opening up the vegetation, large grazers also help to reduce the risk of wildfire, especially in Mediterranean areas. But despite all these benefits, current policy and practice are failing to provide enough support for extensive grazing. So considering the wide range of benefits of extensive grazing, at least the gap should create a level playing field for extensive grazing compared to more intensive subsidized land use models. But even if we manage to do that, there will still be obstacles, mainly on the national level, because most of the member states still fail to take advantage of existing rules on the European level for extensive grazing. Or even worse, they impose additional conditions which really frustrate the practice of extensive grazing. We therefore need more alignment in support at European and national levels. Member states in particular need to adopt broader definitions of grasslands that include wood pastures and other grazed habitats to render them eligible for CAP subsidies. The same goes for permanent grasslands, wetlands and forests. Land users lose the right to subsidies when flooding occurs, while in some countries grazing and forests is still prohibited. It's clear this has to change. Subsidies must become more flexible in order to benefit people and nature as much as possible. Moving from policy to practice, we recommend landowners and herd managers work with primitive, sturdy, local breeds that are accustomed to living in feral or wild conditions. And it's not only the breed that matters, but also the social structure of the herd. Social herds are preferred from an animal welfare point of view, but they also use landscapes in a different way and enhance biodiversity on a greater scale. Such herds are also better able to defend themselves against predators, with younger animals learning from older ones. 
countries should take advantage of the possibility offered by the European Animal Health Regulation to create a special category for more or less free roaming herds of domestic livestock, which takes into proper account the natural, social behaviour of these herds. To further support biodiversity, the use of deworming medicines in herds occupying natural areas should be stopped. Healthy dung without deworming medicines is a rich source of biodiversity. But deworming medicines harm biodiversity, as well as the capacity of dung beetles to transport organic materials, and thereby carbon, into the soil. Carcasses of large herbivores are a rich source of biodiversity as well, with hundreds of species participating in the so-called circle of life. EU regulations allow farmers to leave carcasses in the field following a veterinarian check, but only a few countries take advantage of this possibility. For the sake of biodiversity, we ask all member states to leave carcasses in the field wherever possible. These are just a few of the recommendations. It is clear that greater support for extensive grazing should be prioritised in European policy relating to agriculture, climate, food and environmental issues. With some small but essential changes to laws and regulations at a European and member state level, this can be realised. Large grazers have always been critical to the functioning of healthy, biodiverse ecosystems. It is also clear that they play a crucial role in wildfire prevention, carbon storage and other public goods. It's time to restore their place in the landscape. Right now, we need them more than ever.